Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. On the Logistics of Logistics, I talk to experts in logistics and transportation, warehousing, fulfillment, supply chain, and of course, technology. And during these interviews, I'm always the one asking the dumb questions. I ask the dumb questions so you don't have to. Today's topic is the evolution of warehousing with my friend Joe Oliero. Joe is the Vice President of Sales and Chief Real Estate Officer at Wagner Logistics. Wagner needs a Chief Real Estate Officer because they are huge. 7 million square feet of operations across 26 locations in the United States consistently recognized as one of the leading 3PLs in the nation. Joe is a very knowledgeable and interesting guest, so check out our conversation. But before we get to the interview, I want to tell you about my friends over at Tusk Logistics. That's T-U-S-K logistics.com. Tusk Logistics is a national small parcel network made up of the very best regional small parcel carriers. Tusk delivers reliable service, predictable pricing, and proactive support at lower costs, sometimes up to 40% less than the big guys, UPS and FedEx. Implementation is easy, and the Tusk team is absolutely obsessed with customer service and putting the shipper first. Check them out at tusklogistics.com and click the Get Started button. I will put a link in the show notes so you can reach out and talk to my friends over at Tusk Logistics. So how's it going, Joe? Great, Joe. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to talk to you about this topic. Joe, please introduce yourself and your company, where you're calling from today. Yes, Joe Oliero, Wagner Logistics. We are based in Kansas City, Missouri. We occupy roughly 7 million square feet across 20 different, 26 different operations in the U.S. And we specialize in contract warehousing for companies, we do a, a lot in the paper industry, outdoor power, energy, consumer packaged goods. We're all over the board. And the Wagner was founded in 1946. So after, Whoa. after yeah, after 78 years uh, in the business, where we've pretty much seen it all. So started out as Wagner Cartage Service, and then uh, evolved from there. Very nice, very nice. Now, usually when I talk to people lately on my podcast, we they say we do e-commerce, and there seems to be. We'll talk more about that in a minute because that is big part of the evolution of our space. Do you guys do any e-commerce? We do a little bit. It's mostly on request from customers that we service today, where a lot of our activities, mostly pallet in, pallet out, or case pick type. Uh, the e-commerce operations that we do have are fairly niche or small in, in in comparison to our other larger operations. Yep. What's interesting, we talked for a long time before we hit record. And one of the things is we've seen, we saw a lot of e-commerce grow during the pandemic, but for the most part, the e-commerce sector has disappointed. We thought this is a, a sea change. The world is forever changed. A ton of uh, warehousing companies popped up to serve this monster e-commerce business that was growing and it stalled a little bit. It was sexy, right? It was the sexy thing to talk about. It was the sexy thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, if you say e-commerce, you're like, oh, we're doing something with e-commerce companies. Boy, oh my God, look at me. <laughs> I'm a cool kid now. <laughs> I think we haven't really invested in in each pick e-commerce online retail support mostly because what we found is that the margins on that kind of business are vapor. There, there's basically nothing there. And, and really the only way to make money in, in, in that regard is to leverage your parcel program. And that's and that could go away at any time. Then you're at the uh, mercy of a FedEx and a UPS, or, and it makes it very difficult to make good money unless you've got incredibly high volumes. Yep. This is why I think it's so important to pick uh, a lane to specialize. And you said before we hit record that when you run across to somebody who does paper or something related to paper or, or those other sectors you work in, you you understand their business like the back of your hand because you've been serving that industry for a long time. I think more and more we're seeing the warehousing business 
we talk about evolution, I think it's evolving to these niche, very big niche players, but because it makes sense. Not everybody is going to, to need same day, next day, home delivery. It's important, but it's not the whole market. We've had a market for a long time before the internet was there to let us buy stuff every day and have it delivered to our house. <laughs> Oh, sure. And it's part of that is also an evolution in the roles that are played across the supply chain from the customer side, because procurement has been thrown into so many of these roles. They don't always have that industry experience that the previous generation of VPs of supply chain and, and really had that, that where they would be able to identify whether it's a good partner or not, um, or give the 3PL enough direction so that they don't have to think about it too much. Now where those roles have been swapped where you have a senior buyer or a procurement manager or VP of procurement that you know has to get beyond the spreadsheet, has to get beyond the pivot table and really understand or they need a subject matter expert to come in and, and help them understand what they need to invest in in their supply chain to make it more efficient. Yeah, yeah. That when I was selling logistic services, it was mostly less than truckload. And there was a lot of companies where you would talk to the procurement people and they'd say, oh, go see the guy on the dock, go see the transportation guy. And I think that was a reflection of the how different it is to buy transportation services. As technology has grown, it seems as if also the role of procurement said, nope, it turns out we're spending $7 million a year that has to go under procurement. And, but the challenge became, do I understand enough about transportation or warehousing to make that buy? And they're smart people. They are going to figure that out. I'll give you a perfect example of that. So it's a, a funny cautionary tale. We had a customer that closed down one of the warehouses we were operating for them, and it was a procurement decision. We weren't really involved in that decision. But what we learned later on was that the warehouse was closed. They absorbed it into another location. What that customer didn't do, they didn't look at their contract with Walmart. They didn't do a study to see what the impact of consolidating and what the transportation cost impact would be. They ended up paying $2 million more a year in transportation. And then they also got pinged by Walmart for another million dollars because they violated their contract because they didn't give enough notice. And so it's, it's those kinds of things where, you know, when you involve a partner, a, a third party logistics partner, they become a partner because they can see, they can see the forest from the trees. They can understand what, what impacts that those kinds of decisions will have on your bottom line. That's a big deal. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, I want to switch gears here. Talk a little bit about you. Where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? Give us some career highlights before you joined Wagner Logistics. Sure. I grew up in Lexington, Missouri, which is about 50 miles north and east of Kansas City, Missouri. Small town, 5,000 people. My parents ran a small monument business in Lafayette County, the surrounding county around Lexington. So I spent my summers pushing a wheelbarrow, either full of dirt or full of concrete, uh, while we were setting uh, tombstones in a cemetery. So it was an interesting way to, uh, to grow up. But from there, went on to uh, school at uh, Mizzou or University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri. I made my way back to Kansas City. Let's see, got, uh, feels like ages ago. I just got a business degree from Mizzou made my way back to Kansas City and then got into sales, real estate, and then ended up working with a client, Wagner Logistics. And I was their real estate consultant for well over a decade. And so there's an opportunity for me to take an executive position with them and really leverage my real estate experience and uh, sales experience. And then the overall objective is to help us grow, help us find new customers to do business with and expand our footprint around the country. Yep. So, Well, before we hit record, we were talking a little bit about the importance of real estate in the warehousing business. And I think it's a very niche subject. Um, 
but it's super important. I've had people on the podcast talk about it in the past. Being on the wrong side of the expressway, being on the wrong side of the street can cost you dearly in the warehousing business because trucks say, oh, it takes me an extra 10 minutes to get here or your trucks take an extra 10 minutes to leave every time. It's super important. And also I was telling you, I think my friend Summit Hogue said this, is that in certain markets where rent was going up very rapidly, people would sign these leases for four or five years. And he said, you need to raise your prices because your rent is going to go up 25, 30% at the end of this lease. And he said, people are reluctant. They don't want to give everybody a five or 10% rent uh, increase, right? It's the yeah. difference between success and failure in this business. So I know you're in charge of sales, but I also know you're in charge of real estate over there at Wagner. No, it's interesting because that that that's something that a lot of 3PLs didn't anticipate. They didn't anticipate rates going up. I think from 2021 to 2022, rates went up 20% in one year. So if you're planning your costs which is what the 3PL does. We have to understand our costs or we lose money and the margins are super thin anyway. So if you're trying to plan out your costs for the next three years, you have to anticipate some level of escalation in labor, real estate, and really all of your costs. But the, those two are the big ones. And if you're not planning those appropriately, you will have to have that difficult conversation with your customer to say, hey, these rates are going up. And I think from the real estate side, yeah, you have to plan for that escalation. You have to, and Summit's a great resource for that. I know Summit from past dealings and it's, yeah, it's a big deal. And then from the labor side, I think a lot of 3PLs were anticipating 3 to 5% escalation year over year for costs, uh, for labor cost increases. And it's been more like 8 to 10. So you're you're constantly behind the eight ball if, if you're not being overly conservative about your escalation costs. I know I've talked to people who had facilities in Reno, Nevada. Now, what was cool about Reno is if you were an e-commerce company and you were doing a lot of small parcel, Reno is one day to Los Angeles and Los Angeles is one day to Los Angeles. So you get out of you get out of the LA cost, right? You get out of the LA Los Angeles regs, a little higher than the bar than most other places, and you're in Reno. That worked well until a whole bunch of tech companies like Tesla moved there. And all of a sudden, rent skyrocketed, but also the population skyrocketed there and the cost of getting people went up. And all of a sudden, your contract locked you in, I heard this, this happened to my friend, his contracts were locked in at one price, but he couldn't manage that anymore because his rent was going up and his people were costing him more. It's this is it's not like shooting fish in a barrel, which we'll get, which by the way, let's switch gears and talk a little bit about this evolution of warehousing. I think warehousing was, I won't say a boring business, but well, maybe a little boring. It seemed like it didn't change year to year, decade to decade. And then in the last decade, it's just had this transformation. And one of the transformations was related to e-commerce. But part of that was a lot of companies all of a sudden entered the space to say, not everybody's, not every existing warehouse does e-commerce. We're going to step in. We're going to be tech centric and the e-commerce companies will appreciate that because if you're going to do same day, next day, you're going to need tech and you're going to need people like us who understand. But what we're seeing is a lot of those VC back companies and that being VC back, there's nothing wrong with it. We're, I think we're starting to see a little bit of a bloodletting in this space. <laughs> Maybe not the cream is coming to the top, but some of the, some of the, yeah. Some of the bad smells are coming to the top, right? I said to, to you before we hit record that we're talking about podcasting. When podcasting a few years back, it seemed like it had this moment where it's like, podcasting is everything. And they started, all the stupid money started. And by the way, I would have loved to get received some stupid money, but I did not. But like Meghan Markle and um, not a Prince Harry, they got a podcast. They got paid a small fortune by Spotify. So did uh, President Obama and his wife. 
And I don't think these people, they have a a lot of other interests and they weren't necessarily creating a lot of content. And so all that money that went out and and we've seen something similar in the warehousing space. A lot of new companies popped in. And by the way, do we need them? I think so. Somebody has to do these e-commerce, but we're going to also see a lot of companies leave the field, I think. Uh, We're starting to see some challenges with it. Running a warehouse is not an easy task. And the margins for e-commerce in general are super razor thin. And then you also have across the industry, e-commerce is known for being a meat grinder. You see it more turnover in e-commerce than any other industrial sector across warehouses. Uh, it has underperformed in the last few years. And I think we we all knew that they probably stepped back a little bit after COVID. When we could leave the house, we stopped buying as much stuff. But these were newer companies. So this was, they were a little unpredictable. We saw a lot of companies grow very rapidly, usually VC money. And I will say, I've had people say on my podcast before, is VC money appropriate for warehousing? Now, if it's the very tech-centric piece, yeah, I see that. I think venture capitalists normally steer clear of warehousing and physical assets. I think they're used to data (laughs) and tech. Yeah, I I think Wagner partnered with private equity in in 2021. I think the philosophy of, of that group was, let's find an established business, not necessarily a tech group, that has the opportunity and means for growth or to even become a platform company. So we've taken that and run with it. And frankly, it's been a driver, the horsepower in our engine behind. See, I understand private equity. The nature of it is we want to buy businesses and we want to grow them. We want to have them have profits. We're more of an operator mindset where VC money definitely need it. It is for the more growth oriented, more Maybe I'm just a little bit speculative in some cases. And I know you, when you sometimes hear VC companies say only one out of 10 companies works out for us, even less. So there's an expectation that we're swinging for the fences. We're looking for the next Facebook and we, we know we'll have some flame outs with that. So maybe this is natural part of the market that we saw a lot of money invested in VC backed. And again, I'm, I am I don't have a horse in this race, so I don't look for anybody to fail, but I think we're starting to see some challenges. There was not, I still do this, less, there was on LinkedIn, some an article written and some people talking about some problems they had with their warehousing company. And it was related to, I don't know, it's a he said, she said, but it was related to, hey, I can't get my stuff out of that warehousing company. They over-promised and under-delivered. Yeah, sometimes it's the shipper's fault. So I'm not always going to say, "Aha, look at what these guys failed." That, I'm not. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just pointing out that there's been a little bit of blood in the water, a little bit of challenges that we've seen in the space. Yeah, and, and to your point, I think the the venture capital firms are really looking for those innovative companies that are going to take what is a rapidly changing industry and cap- be able to capitalize on it or be the first movers for something that's going to be maybe not a silver bullet, but it'll be something that helps move companies into the next generation of supply chain. Oh, yeah. And I've interviewed a lot of these companies and a lot of them are killing it and will continue to kill it. So I want to take a quick time out to tell you about my friends over at Green Screens. That's greenscreens.ai. Green Screens is a dynamic pricing technology for the truckload spot market that delivers buy and sell side market intelligence to help brokers and 3PLs grow and protect their margins. Freight brokers and 3PLs using green screens gain the following advantages. Faster pricing for both buy side and sell side transactions. Pricing that is more accurate and more likely to win profitable business. Guys, dynamic pricing is the next killer app. Hundreds of freight brokers are already using it because it enables them to develop faster, more accurate quotes. This is the time. Check out Green Screens in the show notes, greenscreens.ai. So getting back to it, we talked a little bit about the changing role of procurement. We talked a little bit about VC-backed companies. And again, with e-commerce underperforming, it was almost a given that some of these companies that said we're going to serve the e-commerce companies would underperform with them. Let's talk about customer acquisition costs. I got a phone call 
mm, a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, and it was from a company in warehousing. And they said, we are dying because there's a lot of companies are all of a sudden spending a lot of money on Google ads. So we used to use Google ads for our city and warehousing, and we would pop up in the search results and we get a fair amount of business that way. And they said, oh, we just talked about the VC money. When you typed in a, a zip code and warehousing, you end up with 25 sponsored, <laughs> 25 sponsored companies. So the co- cost of customer acquisition skyrocketed in the space. Am I right to say that? I would totally agree with that 100%. And it's because it's all about standing out, right? It's all about saying, hey, here I am, here's my purple feathers and come check us out. But if everybody's got purple feathers, if everybody's number one on the first page of Google, you can't do a Google search anymore without seeing 10 sponsored results before you get to the actual results. It's insane. And then from our standpoint, from my perspective, we win business when we have a relationship, when one of our competitors is not performing And then when we are top of mind with a decision maker and really the only way to be top of mind with a decision maker is to show them what you can do. I'm from the show me state, right? So we typically have to show them some kind of case study that's a, that's within one or two standard deviations of the type of product and business that they're looking to have us operate. Yeah. You said it earlier before we hit record is this whole idea of when you specialize like you guys have, you get case studies and you have some customer testimonials and you say, we know the biggest problems in paper because we have a whole bunch of customers in paper. And I that's that kind of brings us to the next topic I want to talk to you about, which was this idea of specialization. I think we're going to start seeing companies and we're already seeing it, but I think we're going to see more of it where somebody says, we do e-commerce warehousing and we have locations across the country and this is what we do. And if you ask us to do cold chain, no. If you ask us to do pallet in, pallet out, no. And I talked to Dusty over at Red Stag Fulfillment. They do big, bulky, small parcel shipments. When somebody comes to them with smaller stuff, says, can you move makeup? Yeah, we can, but we do big, bulky, small parcels. So we're not, we're going to say no to you so we can say yes to our ideal customer. And I think we're seeing much more of that. As are you seeing? You're you guys are kind of one of the one of the the OGs of specialization. So of course you see that, right? No, absolutely. And, and it, it, you can't be a jack of all trades and have a, a system for all these different types of product and with the, I guess the resources that you need to do that are substantial and. I think part of it is because there's efficiencies in specializing, but I think it's also beginning to drive mergers and acquisitions because if we ever wanted to get into e-commerce, we would never try to reinvent that wheel. We would, if we wanted to become a leading expert in e-commerce and each pick retail fulfillment, We would never go and try to build that from within. It's too expensive. We would go and find a company that's for sale and we would bring them into the platform and you you might pay a little bit extra, but you're buying something that works. And I I think some of the M&A activity that you're seeing across the logistics landscape is driven by that because it's so expensive to try to infiltrate a new industry or new sector you might as well go buy the company. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And very closely related to this is customer fit. We saw during the pandemic, again, a lot of e-commerce companies were having a moment. The warehousing companies that supported them, they they were doing well. And I think if you're VC backed, and they're not just VC backed, but a lot of people said yes to customers they should have said no to. And now we're in this great unraveling, I think, where they say, you know what? I would love to work with Joe, but Joe's too small for me and he'd be better off somewhere else. And during the pandemic, I had a number of companies call me and say, no one will work with me. I need a warehouse space and no one will work with me because a lot of companies grew 
pretty rapidly. And they just said, and there's another piece, which is as significant as you guys are with 26 locations all across the U.S., you say no to a lot, I'm sure, because that's how you specialize. So when somebody says, could you just do this for me? <laughs> we have a whole committee inside uh, Waggers made up of all the executive and they decide whether or not to put resources toward certain opportunities. And we have to be, we have to be very selective because a lot of times the smaller customers take just as much time and attention and nurturing as a large fortune 100 company. It's uh, yeah. So you have to be careful where you're going to dedicate your resources because they can put you in a, in a real bind if you're not careful. So it's the specialization is part of it, but also the this customer size. And again, this has come up time and time again on my podcast about customer fit. I think as we saw this boom in warehousing and everyone's excited about the same day, next day, and everything's going quickly to the world's changing. And everybody said, yes, we can support that. And again, I think if you're a newer company, you, the tendency is to say yes until you realize I'm losing money on this business. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a scary conversation to have <laughs> yes yes so we've talked about a whole bunch of stuff so we talked about procurement that's the role of procurement for a long time i think we had purchasing and procurement people saying no just talk to transportation or traffic or supply chain they manage that but as the world's changed here procurement said no there's a big spend we better get involved so more and more companies have procurement involved that's changed we talked about specialization Talked about customer fit, very closely related. Talked about the customer's acquisition costs have gone up really rapidly. And we talked a little bit about the real estate also, because the real estate is part of that. If real estate and labor costs go up really rapidly and you're tied to a contract that um, doesn't have flexibility to go up, you're in trouble. <laughs> and we, we're when we're seeing that, we talked about the VC-backed companies and some of the challenges they had. I know another, probably the biggest issue, one of the biggest issues, is labor. Talk about the challenges we're seeing and the evolution of the space as a result of labor. Yeah, finding and retaining workers is always a challenge. It's not going away anytime soon. And we're having to get creative with how we get in front of and really retain those customers. I think we spend $1,000 per recruit and that's just to recruit an employee so a thousand dollars per employee that we're trying to recruit day in day out from a, i guess from a high level it's still a male dominated industry 74 percent but what i've found average age is 38 um that's an older average age than i thought you'd say i, I was surprised at that myself I'm well past 38, but I know at 38, I was f starting to feel little aches and pains and I didn't walk uh, long distances <laughs> with stuff in my arms. That's going to be a challenge. We're going to have to find a way to make that work less taxing on the body. First off, because you mentioned the first part, 74% male, it would be nice if we could attract women to this job. I'm not saying it's necessary. It's just, it would be nice. And Part of that is saying, okay, I'm not going to have a job that hurts everybody's back. I'm not going to have a job that has to be done by a guy. And we're losing a big opportunity in the labor force. Yeah. Well, and, and you're from Detroit, you know, the automotive industry, and how that assembly line has changed and those roles have changed across the assembly line. It's no different in a warehouse. You go from what used to be lifting 50 pound sacks of grain and nobody complained until they got home and or they went and saw the chiro chiropractor. It's those roles that are changing. It's the expectations for labor in the warehouse that's changing. It's also in order to attract someone to, to the warehouse, you've got to be able to offer competitive benefits. You might have to offer a signing bonus. And then the benefits themselves need to measure up with the life stage that person is in, whether they're living on their own, if they're trying to raise a family, or if they're in the latter pre-retirement stage of, of life, they need, they want a benefits package that's going to cater to that. So we've had to make those adjustments. There's multiple companies that, including us, that have removed the initial drug test from the employment screening. And that's mainly to just speed up the time from when you first see this person to when they sire, sign the employment agreement, 
Because if it takes longer than maybe a week or two, they're going to go find something else. Because there's just that many options in front of them. Yeah, I've said before on my podcast, if right now, if I didn't have the skill sets I had, and let's just say I was 25 years old and I said, okay, I, I don't have a degree in anything. I don't have a skill set. I would do DoorDash. I would do Lyft. I would do a lot of jobs like that where I can drive around and listen to my music and drink soda or pop <laughs> and have my flexibility. So you have to convince me why I should go to that warehouse. It had better be a better job than driving a, a Lyft. Oh, yeah. Me. And you're taking away my flexibility. So I've thought this, maybe it's wishful thinking, but this is how I'm thinking about it is, we have to make that job the first step in a supply chain career, as opposed to, hey, we hired you because you're strong and you can walk around and pick things up. I, I don't think that's going to be very appealing for very long to uh, somebody because it's hard work. And we and the industry struggles with temp agencies and sourcing temp labor. It's not reliable. It's a very difficult thing to deal with because you might need five employees. And you have to ask for 10 because two aren't going to show up, two you're going to have to fire for the end of the day, and one's going to walk out before noon. So it's, you end up putting yourself in a position in that regard with temp labor to not really run an efficient warehouse. It's a conditioning problem. Most people aren't strong enough. They don't have enough stamina to make something like that work in a lot of cases. I'm going to say that's a generalization, but I know there's some truth to it. Somebody who's not in good shape, even if they're young and somebody says, hey, here's your new job. You're going to be on your feet a lot and you're going to be lifting things and you're going to be measured on some sort of efficiency. <laughs> not going to work. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you guys are using some robots and tech. Talk a little bit about that because that's another evolution we're seeing in the warehousing space. Yeah. So we have a facility in, uh, in Monroe, Louisiana, where we operate with uh, AGVs that shuttle products. What would you say you use? Uh, aut automated gui guided vehicles, AGVs. Okay. And they shuttle product uh, raw materials into the manufacturing plant that we service. And then they bring the finished goods back out to a staging zone where they're then picked up and, and put into rack. We've also worked with robotics on an each picking level for an e-commerce group that, that we, that we provide. It was basically arts and crafts. So things, small item, each pick fulfillment, anything from a paintbrush to a small pad of paper. And we had uh, robots in the library and they would go and pick from the library, they knew exactly where to go. And they bring the product over to a pick wall. And so we integrated, integrated that with our WMS and the intent there, because we were leasing the robots and the software itself, the intent there was to develop a scalable e-commerce solution that we could leverage or scale up, scale down, however we needed to. We bought the racking or the shelving from Home Depot and tried to use cost efficiencies there. And then built out this library that could be multiplied 10x if we wanted it to. And so we have that in our quiver. We've had that level of experience of how to deal with robots, how to deal with automation. And it's a lot of work. It's a lot of resources for each big commerce. And it's a great lesson to learn. I'm glad that we did it. And we've since moved on to other things, but we're really trying to apply that automation to larger scale case picking operations and pallet in, pallet out. And how do we automate long travel movements, repetitive movements within a larger rather than focusing on e-commerce? I just did a podcast. I just published it and I'm trying to think of the name, but it was talking about these exosuits. Oh, yeah. And I talked to the guys from HeroWare and I was super impressed with what they were doing. Some of those suits, they not only help you pick things up, but they don't allow you to bend over too fast. So it's control of your movement. It's wild. I'll have Natalie put that in the show notes for us, but it's, I talked to Mark Harris from Hero Wear. We called it the podcast called Rise of the Exosuits. And some of the challenges you have with that is you have, these exosuits are really, think of that exoskeleton that an ant has. It's a, but it has to be comfortable. It can't be too heavy. It can't get hot. 
So it has to be lightweight, has to be, you don't want a whole bunch of training necessary for it. And, but it's just the beginning of what we're seeing with, and I got an email yesterday for some, another company very similar that does stuff for shoulders. Because if we start to injure people, not only is it's going to get costly because they're going to be your workman's comp, but they're also not going to be at your company doing their the work that you hired them to do. And at some point, morale is down. If somebody's got a bad back because of the job, it's hard to imagine they're going to do a good job. We're going to have to do a lot more with technology going forward because we have to make this job easier. But I think also when they're using technology and they say, hey, now I understand the technology, I understand how it connects to the larger system and the supply chain. Now you've started to move them towards a supply chain career as opposed to them saying, hey, I've been doing that. I've been working in the same warehouse for 20 years. <laughs> I just don't think we're ever going to see that. Again, I, the, the ch- other challenge we have, the baby boomers are retiring. We have 400,000 fewer people in the next generation. And those 400,000 people are a lot wealthier than they have been in the past. And as we nearshore stuff from China, I think you're going to start to see we have to really compete for those guys. So you're not going to be able to compete with, hey, this is a great job. We're we're going to have you walking around and lifting stuff all day and and there's no career advancement. That is just, no thanks. (laughs) If it was your kid, you'd be like, hold up, let's get you back to school. (laughs) That's not for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just doing the general labor, but if there's no clear path to career development, like you're saying, there's much less of an incentive to stick around. If, right. you, if you don't have an Abner shut type path from the ground floor to the boardroom, it's, uh, it can be disappointing. Yeah. It's a, it's, this sounds like such an old timey thing to say, but in the olden days, my dad grew up in Dearborn, Michigan, where Ford Motor Company is at, and he went to work at Ford Motor Company at 17 years old. By the way, my dad's had long past, but he said, we'd be out playing baseball constantly. And she, he said, Henry Ford himself would ride by on his bike, stop and watch us play, and then say, how old are you kids? That we'd say, oh, we're 13 or 14. So you going to come work for me? <laughs> and they're like, he goes, you got to graduate. But when you graduate, you're going to come work for me. And we're like, yeah, sure. And he goes, after a while, it's like, oh, it's this old man Ford driving around on his bike. <laughs> and... But my dad said when he got to the apprenticeship program that was engineering, he said they would say to us that the apprenticeship program that you're in is the same one that the vice president of engineering went to, the directors of engineering went to, the managers, supervisors, and the, everybody in between. And we left that program behind. And we started with the mindset of we're going to get people right out of college in the 60s. And there's some strength to that. I'm not against that. But we have to, in certain environments, start to look and say, can we develop some education and some career paths so these guys and gals have a path to a supply chain career, not just a job at a warehouse? Yeah, absolutely. Stepping off my stepping off my soapbox. <laughs> so anyway, Joe, I'm going to summarize this and I want to get your final thoughts on it. So we've talked about a lot. They, we really have seen a big change, a lot of evolution in the warehousing business. It's not that tired old dingy workshop that we used to see. We talked about the changing role of procurement and how procurement guys are involved. And they've got that, that makes the bar a little higher. We talked about the need for specialization in the space. We're starting to see more and more of that. Customer acquisition costs have gone through the roof. We have to figure that out. Customer fit is more important than ever. We found a lot of companies brought on customers that, for whatever reason, aren't a good fit. We talked about the VC-backed warehousing companies. Some have done real well. Some are struggling, which is expected. But I think part of those guys, they're part of this customer acquisition costs. We also talked about the labor challenges, which is an ongoing problem. I don't see us fixing that one anytime soon. Joe, final thoughts. I think being able to stick and move. Agility is everything. Being able to look at something objectively and, and say, here's how we solve this problem, solving one problem at a time. And I don't know if any of these problems ever get solved completely there is no silver bullet right but it's a, it's a constant problem solving exercise i think 
I'm always fascinated by the supply chain industry because it demands people that can solve problems and that can solve them well and quickly. So I think that's, I think that's where we're headed. I think we're reaching a point where this industry is maybe not starting to, to, to level out, but the value and expectations of professionals up and down the uh, decision maker chain is becoming better understood and the way customers are um, making decisions is mostly consumer based and based on how they make these supply chains more efficient. So it's been a fascinating ride so far and I'm looking forward to the next couple of years. Yep. And we didn't even really touch on it, but technology, obviously an important part of this 10, 15 years ago, there's a probably, I don't know what percent weren't even using technology. And now there are still companies out there using Excel spreadsheets in their warehouse. There's, and there's still companies out there that are printing things off on paper and walking them across the warehouse to process. We're not beyond the paper order yet. <laughs> Yeah. It's amazing how quickly it's changed. I've joked about it. I used to say people go into warehousing or trucking so they don't have to deal with technology. That wasn't uh, a lie 15 years ago. It's a lie now. <laughs> yeah. For these folks to make efficient decisions, having the visibility to that data to understand all the moves and costs of the moves within the warehouse, it's there's no way to be competitive on a larger volume scale unless you have and can provide that kind of visibility. It's just becoming a standard. Yep. Joe, I like to interview smart, interesting people like you who are killing it in the space. Who else should I interview? Let's see. I can think of a couple. There is a gal uh, based in uh, Brooklyn, New York, Casey Golden with LuxLock. Casey Golden, Lux Locko. All right. She's killing it in the digital retail sector, which translates somewhat to supply chain, but she created a concierge service for online retailers, basically to help it, it, it enhance their luxury experience. So quick example, if you, if you or your significant other went and spent and I'm from a small town, so this is a lot for me. I don't know if it's not for you. If, if somebody went and spent $5,000 at Chanel, she would take that data from Chanel. And then if you went and made a reservation at Open Table, she'd be able to capture all that information. And the next time you go to Chanel to, to blow your paycheck, <laughs> she, she would hand you, or that Chanel uh, clerk would hand you the same glass of wine that you had at your Open Oh, yeah. I think it's super important now. We know that logistics never thought we would be dragged into the customer experience, but we are dragged into that customer experience. Uh, home delivery, and um, we talked a little bit about e-commerce. All of this is, but even, I still say this, even if you have nothing to do with the customer, the B2B or B2C, I should say, when we go to, when we understand that really good experience we had with in our consumer life we expect that when we come to work <laughs> so that can that consumer grade experience we expect it <laughs> yeah another name for you kelly mingori with webster bank i've watched her really do some amazing things from a financing standpoint for transportation companies throughout the mid Interesting. Yeah, and it, it's it with the cost of trans transportation in flux, the scarcity of chassis, the scarcity of transportation equipment. You have to lean pretty heavily on your financier to give you decent rates and help you have that pulse on the market. So you might just think of somebody as a banker, but for for a banker in the transportation industry, it's it's pretty intense. And I have a lot of admiration for what she, what she does day to day. We absolutely positively need better financing in the space because there's a lot of, we are so dependent on the owner operator. I'll call it the long tail of that loan owner operator. And a lot of them, those are, trucks are wildly expensive and you're driving it. It's drinking that diesel fuel, which is expensive. I think it costs 20% more to eat at a truck stop than it does to eat at Walmart. And 
when after you've spent all that money and then somebody says, yeah, we'll pay in 30 days. Yeah, how am I supposed to get to my next deal and then my next deal? And so we have to have better financing. And I know a lot of companies are popping up, but we need them. (laughs) We need them. You go online and look at freight waves or any of the media outlets. How many trucking companies have gone down this year? And it's it. And by the way, these aren't fly by night companies. These are a lot of times third, fourth generation companies. It's a sad thing because it, it, those are a lot of unhappiness in those things. We think we've all seen it. We all have known people who've suffered because of it. Anyway, enough of my blather. What I'll do is I'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile. I'll put a link to your website and any other links you and your marketing team give me. I'll put those in the show notes so we can reach out and talk to you. Joe, what conferences will we see you and the guys from Wagner Logistics at? Let's see. You will see us at the IAMC conference. There's a, it stands for Industrial Asset Management Council. So part of my real estate role will, will take me to, to, to the IAMC events this year. We often attend CSCMP or Council of Supply Chain Management Professional. You'll see us at the Midwest Rail Shippers Association and Midwest Manufacturing Association events as well. Excellent, excellent. Joe, thank you so much for coming on my podcast. I really appreciate it. Joe, this has been fantastic. Thanks so much. It's so great to have an in-depth conversation with somebody who gets as much exposure to some of the insights in the market as you do. So this has been great. I appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you. I tell you, I love my job for that reason. I get to talk to smart people like yourself every day, and I hopefully learn a little bit from each one. (laughs) So thank you so much. And Thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support's very much appreciated. Until next time, onward and upward. You have been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage with leaders in the logistics and supply chain community. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, hit the like button, and leave us a nice review on Apple or Spotify or wherever else you listen. Also, please check out our videos on YouTube and Connect with us on LinkedIn. We're very big on LinkedIn. And you can also reach us on the logisticsoflogistics.com, our website.